the Antarctic seasons to deliver our work, you know, the vital conservation work and the um, and delivering our visitor experiences um, uh, and, and scientific um, data capture, and to also to grow the support that we so vitally need. And we have found it particularly difficult. Alison, I was going to ask you if you just want to just give us a few words on the impact the last 18 months has had on you and, and your team at SGHT. Yes, well, very similarly, um, you know, our museum team in South Georgia had to get back home in a hurry in March 2020, which was the end of the tourist season down there, because, as you probably remember, all of the international flights were being cancelled like crazy and, you know, they were 8,000 miles from home, so it was a scary time, um, but fortunately, with the help of uh, the South Georgia government and others, we managed to get everybody back to the UK safely. But since then, the museum at Grit Vicken has remained closed and also uh, we haven't had the opportunity, as we usually do, to get face to face with visitors on South Georgia and their donations and their purchases from the museum shop are what keeps our charity going and keeps us able to do our conservation work on the island of South Georgia. So that's been a blow, but you know, thanks to things like trading through our online shop and taking these chances to have more engagement with supporters and our partnership with UKHT on, you know, various uh, talks and events, which has been brilliant, that's kept supporters like you um, donating to us, keeping us going. So thank you all so much. And it's been a really nice opportunity to meet more of you online as well. So, you know, this event is kicking off our joint auction, which is another opportunity for us as charities to interact with you, to say thank you for supporting us and encourage you to do a bit more. And we're delighted to welcome both Daphila and Elaine um, as artists talk about the work that they've kindly donated to the auction and how Antarctica and South Georgia have inspired their work and how it's possible to capture the wonder of the landscapes and wildlife in Antarctica and South Georgia through art. And there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask your art related questions after their presentations. Um, you'll see in our chat function, uh, the auction link. So, you know, if you want to bid on Daphila's work or Elaine's work afterwards, you'll be able to do that. And remember, these are very exclusive special pieces that we're bringing to you tonight. Um, so I think we'll start now with uh, Daphila and we're looking forward to hearing about her experiences as an artist in the Antarctic. So over to you, Camilla. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, absolutely delighted. A very similar story for UKHT as well. We, uh, we were unable to run a season in, in 2020, 2021. Uh, the you know, all our plans had to be abandoned, uh, so no conservation work could go on. We couldn't open Port Lockroy, and we weren't able to capture that scientific data that we do each season on the penguin colony for the long-term study of the Gen 2 penguins. And of course, the Port Lockroy post office remained closed, which is uh, devastating for all of us, of course. But closer to home, our plans to mark the 200th anniversary of the first recorded sighting of Antarctica um, with a program, you know, a creative program, cultural program across the UK had to be shelved. Um, but we had to very quickly pivot and change and, um, and develop a new way of doing things. And we all learned how to use things like Zoom, of course, like we are tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to deliver things in a very different way. It's challenged all of us. And as Alison was saying about the impact on SGHG, you know, it's, it's hugely challenging. But I, I suppose just as importantly and even more so, and the fundamental point is, we, you know, it's been a catastrophic loss of income for both of our charities, you know, unable to trade in a normal way, unable to, um, you know, have their face-to-face, one-to-one engagement with visitors and, and, and um, supporters. We weren't able to do events like this in person like we would normally do. So it's been very, really challenging and we've tried to mitigate the best we can as, as Alison described in lots of collaborative ways and fundraising and, and looking at ways of income generation. And, and as Alison says, you know, we're grateful for the huge amount of support we've had over the last 18 months and that without you, we couldn't do it. Um, so it's, you know, it's wonderful to see you and great that, um, you know, to have your support. So you can see why we're doing it. But as, Elaine, as um, uh, Alison said, said, you know, the, the stars of the evening tonight are, of course, Elaine and Daffler. And it's my huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Daffler Scott, um, our esteemed vice patron at UKAHT, um, a renowned zoologist and decorated artist of wildlife and more recently abstract landscapes. Daffler, many of you also know, of course, is granddaughter of Captain Robert Falcon Scott, from whom she must have inherited her passion for the natural world. 
She's a regular visitor to Antarctica, of course, and, but, but in early 2020, Daphne visited the Ross Sea region of Antarctica for the first time, visiting the huts built by her grandfather during those famous expeditions more than a century ago. Happily, she managed to get back to the UK just before we were all plunged into lockdown. I think it's quite an <laughs> interesting journey home. Um, and she joins us tonight, and I'm delighted to say um, to welcome you, Daphla. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about your work and your inspiration. So over to you, Daphla Scott. Thank you so much, Kamala. Um, well, this is an oil painting of uh, Captain Scott's hut, my grandfather's hut at Cape Evans in the Ross Sea, um, which I did last year after our trip. And as you all know, I'm sure this is where he set off for his journey to the South Pole from, and of course, sadly, he didn't come back. We went there when the weather was absolutely terrible. And uh, initially we, we absolutely couldn't land. So we had to wait for a couple of days before it was even possible. And even then it was touch and go. The temperature was minus 12 centigrade and the wind was 20 knots and the sea was actually freezing. Um, but the, the very wonderful crew did manage to get us all ashore. And we went into the hut in small parties for about 10 minutes each and it was amazing um, as you know the cold preserves everything and so it, it's very much like it was when they left it and it, it does almost feel like they could walk in at any moment and we had a little bit of time after we were in the hut to look around the place and got the hill behind but not very much so really it was impossible to draw it was far too cold and, and you know as soon as I took my gloves my outside gloves off it was just too cold to actually uh, draw with the pencil. So I took a few photos and then, and then had a really good look. Um, but my normal way of drawing when I'm in the, well, in a lot of places actually, is to make very quick um, pen, pen and ink sketches. So if you look at the next image, the, um, this, so my, actually my first trip to the Antarctic as an artist was uh, in 2011 when I was, uh, artist in residence for the Friends of the Scott Polar Research Institute and I was lucky enough to go to the peninsula um, with, with them and a courtesy of the Navy and uh, so I, I would make masses of these drawings in my little notebook and then I would come back to the ship and maybe work them up a little bit um, and this one was probably somewhere near Deception Island because yes you can see Deception to the bottom left and, and the bottom right there's Fur Seal and Pintado Petrol, which were waiting for us on the, on the shore. <clears throat> um, and in the next image, you can see that I also was very much inspired by the icebergs. Icebergs are so amazing because they can be so many different shapes and so many different sizes and colors, and they're, they're just incredible. So I made lots and lots of drawings of, of different icebergs and a bit of the birds too. And in the next slide, We'll see that I'm also that I was also interested in the landscape. So the peninsula, but also of course the Ross Sea is incredibly spectacular. The mountains are amazing. And um, in the bottom left, I did a, a, a very sketchy drawing of Adelaide Island, which is off the peninsula. And then in the next image, you will see my finished painting resulting from it. And that I did when I when I actually got home. So I'm also, I'm also interested in, in people and the interactions of people on, on, uh, in, on the Antarctic continent. And so in the next image, you will see um, a lot of drawings of people meeting up at a scientific basis. So when I was um, down with the Navy, uh, I was able to visit several scientific places and, and watch the people and look at their collaborations um, over science. And in the next image, you will see a finished painting that I did as a result of that. I'm always so impressed by the Antarctic Treaty. It, it's one of the most wonderful um, international collaborative efforts, which so far, despite you know, some tensions, works incredibly well. And, and it's so marvelous that the continent should be just for science and, and peaceful, uh, peaceful activities, and that there should be such collaboration between nations. And I just hope it goes on for a long time. But I was also interested in wildlife. So in the next image, you will see that um, I, we, I had a wonderful day at Port Lockcoy, where I was um, in the middle of the penguin, the Gentoo penguin colony, and able to just sit there and draw them 
and they are such lovely subjects to draw. They don't, you know, they do sometimes move fast, but they also sit still quite a lot. So that's very helpful to someone, you know, trying to get their shape right and everything. So lots of drawings of them. And then in the next slide, you will see that I um, also was able to go to a, a chinstrap penguin colony. That was on, uh, that was at Gourlay on Sydney Island, which is in the South Orkneys. And once again, it was just so lovely to sit down and, um, and draw them. So I sat for two hours until I was so cold that I had to go back to the hut where there was a hut and I could warm up a little bit. And then I spent another two hours sitting there and it was, they're just so lovely. You know, if you sit down, they come a little bit closer and then they just get on with their own thing. So it was really, really lovely. So then if we go on to the next thing, I mostly um, did the drawings, but I also did some watercolours. This is a diary watercolour of Desolation Island, which was one of the first islands we came to. And then in the next one, you'll see um, that I did in, 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 in a written diary, I had pages where I just did watercolours. It wasn't watercolour paper, but it, so it didn't take very well. But anyway, so you've got Deception Island on the left, and then you've got um, Bruce Island and Many Island on the right. And the amazing thing about the Antarctic, of course, is the the, is the, the elements and the, and the wind and the, and the sky and the colours are, are so wonderful. They're, there's just never ending inspiration. So in the next image, uh, you'll, you'll see a few more. There's a couple more from my diary. Um, the first iceberg we saw and the Pintado petrels. And then in the following one, you'll see about one of the very few images that I did directly from nature. So I, I had a, a, a very good cabin when I was with the Navy because I borrowed the first officer's cabin, which was really large. And so I could look out the window and actually draw from it. So this is a pastel done directly from the window. Um, so that was that was quite good. I, I did I did some oils when I was there, there but, I, but I didn't do a lot. I was a bit afraid of damaging the furniture <laughs> in the, because it was such a beautiful cabin. And uh, I did a bit of palette knife oil, but, but not a lot. Okay, in the next slide, um, I go on to the next, to, to, to our Ross Sea trip, which was uh, last February. And here, once again, I did my drawings in my little notebook. And here are some albatrosses and Antarctic petrels. And, and we saw quite a number of whales and there it shows the difference in, in fluke pattern of, di of different whales. So in the next image, um, you was, I did some watercolors as well. And then if we go on, these are more images and you can see that I've used these uh, images to paint from because, because I've used them quite a lot. And so they've got covered in oil paint as my brush sent spray flying. And then if we go on, I was very much interested in the way that the sea froze because when it first freezes, as I'm sure many of you know, it goes greasy and it looks really strange and, and all the, all the big waves sort of die back and it becomes a bit oily. And then gradually the little tiny circles of ice get bigger and bigger and they make pancakes. And then the pancakes get bigger and bigger and they get raised edges. And then eventually, of course, they coalesce. But I, I thought this was really fascinating because I'd, I'd never actually seen the, the whole process from start to finish. So it, it was very exciting. And then in the next image, I think we have um, a watercolor version and on the left, you know, they're just developing and then gradually they get bigger. And they're, they're very beautiful things, the pancakes. And so I did a number of watercolors on the, on the uh, Rossi trip. And, and in the next couple of images, I think we've got a couple more. So if you go on to the next image, you will see, I hope you will see, oh, it's the, the icebergs as well. Well, I can't stop drawing icebergs, they're so amazing. So these are just some, uh, just the selection of watercolors of icebergs. Um, but then then um, somewhere a bit further on, there's, um, there's one, there's a, a watercolor of this. Yes. So here, so on the bottom right, there's, there's uh, grease ice and then open water. And then on the left, there's, you know, there's more ice. And then there's, you know, anyway, different different scenarios. But it was fun doing watercolors because you know, they were quick and, and I could do them in my cabin because I had a much smaller cabin, obviously, on the Ross Sea trip. So in the next image, um, I'll show you some finished pictures. So, so here is a pastel that I did. We saw some, we didn't see very many penguins and we never went to a penguin colony on the Ross Sea trip, but we saw um, chinstraps and adelies on 
the Baleni Islands where the, the, the Adelis were molting, so they were just sitting really still. And that's one uh, parcel that I've made of that. And then I think in the next three images, you see finished paintings that I've made um, since I was back. So here is a snow petrel in front of an iceberg and some not quite fast ice. And then in the next one, you will see um, this, these are the Transantarctic Mountains. So a lot of the time we were in McMurdo Sound, we had this wonderful vista of, of mountains um, on the uh, western shore and the sun would play over them when the sun did come out, which is not very often. Um, and so this is, this is um, an image of that. Again, done from my little sketches. And the next one is similarly um, uh, here, just the sun and the amazing blue shadows. That they that are cast because the sky, you know, if the sun's out, the sky is blue and the, and the snow and ice reflect the wonderful blue. And then finally, a last iceberg because I can't resist icebergs. And the Antarctic is awesome. So, I mean, I hope that it will go on being the pristine place that it is now. And I'm full of admiration for the work that both the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and the South Georgia Heritage Trust do in restoring the historic artifacts there because, because it's really wonderful and it's incredibly inspiring to see. So I'm happy to donate a small watercolor, which is in the next slide, which was of the hut that my cap, that Captain Scott, my grandfather made at Hut Point, um, which I did when I came back from the Antarctic. And I hope you will all support the auction because it's all in a very good cause. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Daphla. Fantastic and uh, what beautiful uh, drawings and paintings and just so interesting to hear about how they, they came about as well. Um, now I'm really delighted uh, to introduce another artist, uh, Professor Elaine Shemilt, who's one of the founders of the South Georgia Heritage Trust and one of its vice chairs. As an artist, Elaine's work has been inspired by her ongoing connection and love of the island of South Georgia and has been exhibited internationally at the Tate Modern, Hayward Gallery, Macro Roma and at Casa Goldoni Museum in Venice. So Elaine's going to tell us a little bit now about her printmaking inspired by South Georgia and to mention uh, the pieces that she has kindly donated to the auction. I'll just... Up. Presentation. Over to you, Lynn. Thanks, Alison. Well, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about the way I work as an artist and my involvement with the subantarctic island of South Georgia. Next, Alison. I'm an established and old artist with an emphasis on the old, um, but I'm principally a printmaker. And the process of printmaking means that the artist works in reverse. Um, this image, for example, was created on the etching plate back to front in order that it would print in reverse, i.e. the right way round. Next. So probably as a result of this, I tend to think in layers always aware that in the end, I'll use a key image to make sense of my idea. I make painting, sculpture, installation, and I use a lot of photography. I believe that contemporary printmaking is not confined by tradition or medium. Next. Over the years, I've worked a lot with scientists, and one of my many collaborations was my involvement with the James Hutton Institute, or formerly the Scottish Crop Research Institute. Erwinia is a potato pathogen that destroys crops, particularly in third world countries. Um, this work came about as a result of trying to visualize the genome sequence of the potato pathogen Erwinia. Next. So my mission was to help these scientists to raise the profile of a new understanding. The challenge for me is always how to make sense of it all in visual terms. When I work with scientists, I try to be precise, clear, and unambiguous, despite sometimes representing an ambiguous concept. The presentation of scientific information has a deserved reputation for being literal 
and representational next. But as a contemporary artist and printmaker, I'm naturally interested in collaboration to move the boundaries of interpretation and convey complex ideas and scientific insight. So my method is a process of experimentation, discovery, resolution, and critical reflection. It's more the sort of pursuit of the image, the unlimited image. And my work has also taken me to remote environments. So nearly 20 years ago, I developed a passion for the remote environment of South Georgia. Next. This actually came about because in 2001, I received a commission from the military to undertake a series of artworks in the Falkland Islands. And this was to commemorate the 1982 conflict. Next. So for many years, I worked as a war artist, watching and observing various conflicts. And I have an informed and particular horror of civil war. Next. This was my first experience of collaboration on a large scale. And it wasn't with scientists, it was with the military. It resulted in an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum, which really featured the work that was done in the field hospital on Ajax Bay. However, it was from the vantage point of the Falkland Islands that I became aware of the existence of South Georgia. Next. So I have to say, I'm an artist, I'm not a scientist, and I'm definitely not a politician. But I do try to raise the profile of this extraordinary place through visual means. South Georgia, as many of you will know, is an isolated mountainous subantarctic island situated in the South Atlantic Ocean. There are significant conservation issues to be tackled. And of course, art and science collaborations, as I see it, are an intelligent and creative response to a problem that needs to be addressed. Next. South Georgia lies within the Antarctic Convergence, and apart from the Falkland Islands or Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, the next landmass is the Ant Ant Antarctic Peninsula. Next. From my perspective, it's one of the most beautiful and most remote places on the earth. 19 years ago, along with a colleague, sadly now deceased, we developed the first of two environmental research projects, the Center for Remote Environments, and then a few years later, the South Georgia Heritage Trust was formed. Next. I have a particular interest in the relationship between art and the environment. But as an artist, I feel that I've got to go further than descriptions. I actively engage in the environmental management of the island. And obviously through my work, I make a very personal interpretation of why I'm drawn to South Georgia. Next. Some of the very early, or well, I'm, I'm in awe of the remoteness of the rest of this island and its otherwise complete lack of visual interference or man-made infrastructure. Is it possible to roll back history and restore the landscape despite the destruction reaped by the whaling industry? Next. Some of the very early work involved hanging out of the side of a helicopter taking photographs, which were then used in government briefing videos and various websites, but that was not enough. Next. Our habitat restoration became the UK's largest and most challenging, challenging privately run wildlife conservation project to date. It was a massive undertaking to remove every last rat from South Georgia. The islands are 100 miles long and the rodents on the coast were threatening the extinction of some of our most treasured birds. Next. And now we're faced with the next question. What is to be done about the whaling stations? How do we address the responsibility from an environmental and cultural industrial perspective. Next. The issue of these post-industrial whaling stations left to collapse in an otherwise unspoilt environment is my personal ongoing South Georgia artistic stroke environmental research challenge. Next. 
For one of my exhibitions, I digitally rendered versions of maps of South Georgia. And then by hand, I worked and reworked their surfaces, creating a three-dimensional effect through blind embossing. The intention of a map is to mirror from evidence the geographical location of a place. In the case of the early hand-drawn maps, it's the imagination of the artist or explorer that the maps more accurately describe. Next. Maps are both texts and images. They also have an intimate relationship with reality as we use them to get around. We generally read them in, direction, in direct relation to our surroundings. Next. But what do we do when we're looking at one of the last unspoiled places in the world? Do we actually want more visitors to South Georgia? Or can we leave this place of wonderment to repair itself? That's the dilemma. The film director, Peter Greenaway said, I've always been fascinated by the particular excitements aroused by a sense of place, the distinction of a particular genius loci. This is true if the place, space or location is indeed a real one, but it's certainly true in the location that has been invented in words or in a painting or in the cinema. Next. So in just a few minutes, that was really the best way that I could explain what it is that I'm trying to do with the limited edition of prints that you see in this auction. I hope it helps you to have a little bit of understanding of the work. Thank you. Fantastic. Elaine Daffler, thank you so, so much. They were wonderful insights into your two um, practices and, uh, and where where your inspiration comes from. Um, we're delighted um, to open up to questions. Given we can fit all on one screen, happy to do this live. So you're very welcome to turn your cameras back on. Um, and if you'd use the raise your hand function, we can happily take questions from you um, uh, from, what, from whatever you'd like to ask. Anyone want to kick off? Let's go with a test. Oh, oh, oh I've got one. I've got yeah, one. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, to both of you, really, I mean, Daphla first, I mean, be between your visits to Antarctica, what changes did you see and how how they um, captured, you know, between your sort of first visit and your most recent visits, what, what changes have you seen um, and what and how, how have they captured those in your in your work? I'm not sure I can say because I went to two different places. So the, on the first visit, I was in the peninsula mm -hmm. and on the second, I was in the Ross Sea. And um, but I can compare. So I had actually been to the Antarctic a, a very long time ago when I, with my parents when I was in my gap year, when I wasn't working as an artist. Um, and the difference there, I don't know that there was very much difference in the area in McMurdo Sound that I that I noticed. But then you know, I'd, I, I'm not sure I, I would have re recorded exactly where the ice came to. You know, I'm sure the Barn Glacier has probably retreated, but I, I, it's not something that I would personally have noticed. What was noticeable is that um, there are many more ships down there now. So when, when we went in, I think we were about the only ship. It was the Lindblad Explorer. Mm -hmm. And in, in 1971, a very long time ago. <laughs> um, but uh, so this time, you know, we met other ships and we and we saw Chinese uh, ships and yeah we saw a number of other ships so I think that was quite a big difference yeah oh, thank you yeah no, interesting and Elaine what about you to your um, person most recent well yeah. I think the most shocking thing is the retreat of the glaciers actually I mean really really I was shocked the last time I went there um and there's an obvious uh Yes, I mean, global warming has had its effect. I haven't been there since we eradicated the rats. Mm. So I hope, if I ever get there again, that um, you can hear the sound of the um, South Georgia pipit and the um, South Georgia pintails and so on and so forth. So that should be a very positive thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, I. I the first time I went was way back in, I think it was something like 2002. Um, and it was 
I mean, that impression will never leave me. And I really, really felt that this was the one time that I was looking at a landscape that had no visual interruptions from man. I don't know if, it, it, if I would feel that way now, but um, I mean, it was, it was a dramatic impression that will never leave me. Mm. Thank mm. you both so much. Uh, Tim, you show us your, your question. Thank you. Hello, um, fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you for organising this. I had the privilege of being a member of the British Antarctic Survey from 1979 to 1982, coming out just uh, before the Argentinians were going in. In fact, I was in Port Stanley the day before they were invaded, so that was a, a bit of a comfort. And then part of the first three-man team back in 1985, post the conflict. Um, whilst I was down, I had the unfortunate experience of um, some members of a passing Russian ship destroying some of my experiments. So my question was really wondering, now that you guys are not in there from the Antarctic Heritage, um, the Subjordia Heritage Trust, looking after the post office and so forth, as far as you know, are things secure and okay as far as uh, things down there are going? Yeah, I'll yeah. Answer. Alison, do you want to, to jump in on that one as well? Well, I mean, the South Georgia Museum is is intact. <laughs> we um, it was closed up, but it has been opened up a few times, um, and we've had a lot of help from uh, one of our friends in British Antarctic Survey, who's been going in and just checking the museum and that the conditions are okay for the collection and that kind of thing. In some ways, you know, we're lucky because. Um, the, the temperature and South Georgia and so on means that actually, you know, the, the sort of environmental impact of leaving the collection for any length of time isn't too great. So, yes, it's all sitting there just waiting for us to come back and we can't wait to get back down again. Uh, what, what would you say, Camilla? Yeah, similar, actually. I mean, like, like you say, I mean, um, we couldn't get down there. All the tourist industry couldn't get down there. So the only people that could really get down there are really the scientists. So it was only really the British Antarctic Survey and, and other nation, national programmes that could get there. Um, and like, yeah, like you, Alison, we have good relationships with BAS and um, actually other programmes, the Ukrainian programme and uh, Chilean and, and others, uh, the Turkish programme as well. So we, we have uh, spies on the ground who uh, were willing and, and able and keen to help by just going down and visiting the sites if they could, um, documenting what they saw, took, took some photographs in an organised fashion for us and sent those back to us, sent us reports on the condition of the buildings. So we're really lucky to be able to have some um, eyes on the ground just to just to report on anything that might be uh, amiss. And more, more generally, I think, you know, as I say, there's um, just much, much less traffic, much fewer people down. Even the programmes are sending very many fewer people. So the ships, the bass ships were, you know, there weren't as many scientists going down, no winterers, of course. So it must have been a very quiet place and the penguins could run amok, surely. <laughs> I think it feels more like. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, what we can do, I mean, what, the other um, purpose of this evening, of course, is to uh, talk a little bit more about the lots available in the auction. And um, so we thought we'd just highlight a, just a, small, a very small number of them um, before we set you loose on the auction itself. Um, but uh, Alison, should I invite you to just talk us through a couple of the items? Thanks very much. So uh, the first uh, item, the first lot I'd like to talk about is called uh, Landscape One by Michael Vasoki. And just a bit of an introduction to who Michael is. Some of you may know that Michael is an award-winning artist who won an international commission uh, to design a new sculpture for South Georgia to reinterpret Gritvik and Whaling Station and really celebrate the return of the whales uh, while also reflecting the past and the industrial past of the island. Michael's work in general, is a subtle reflection on the natural and man-made countryside. His themes explore the world of science, the character of geology and place, and the sense of human impact on habitat. So you can understand why Michael was attracted to the South Georgia Commission and how his work is really a perfect fit for it. Michael has gathered a significant reputation for public and private sculpture, 
Its notable commissions include a memorial to the bicentenary of the abolition of transatlantic slave trade in the city of London. And he was also the recipient of the prestigious Gerwood Sculpture Prize in 2009. And we're extremely lucky to have him as our commissioned artist. Michael has very kindly donated a lot. Can we have the next slide, please? And here it is. It's called Linescape One, and it extends Michael's fascination with the human preoccupation with measuring and surveying land and excavating and altering landscapes. So we're delighted to have this exciting lot in the auction, very special uh, lot for you to potentially bid on. So over to Camilla for the next lot. Yeah, sure. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, really uh, evocative picture here is a, an oil painting by, called Terra Incognita 3 by an artist called Helen J. Young. Um, Helen was going to join us tonight, but unfortunately hasn't been able to. But she's generously donated this hugely expressive painting, which I think captures the power of the glacial landscape of the Antarctic um, really, really keenly. Helen is a kind of a keen polar explorer. She's visited both the North and South polar regions, um, been both the Arctic and the Antarctic, and she takes great inspiration from the, the, those icy landscapes that she encounters there. And her, she's got quite a unique technique, actually. She creates layers um, of oil paint and cold wax uh, on the canvas and then, then scratches into those surfaces. So she builds up these layers and they get different surfaces and textures and colours underneath and then scratches into them. And they, these create these kind of really... So I think I think absorbing and highly tactile sort of abstract works, which I think evoke the colours, the textures, and actually the feelings of Antarctica. I think it's a really beautiful work, and I think um, I was certainly placing a bid. Um, so I hope, hopefully, this will uh, be uh, very popular. Alison, back to you. Thank you, Camilla. And the next lot is lot 26, which is a delightful oil painting of two rock hopper penguins by artist Beverly Ensley. And Bev, I believe, is attending. So thank you, Bev, uh, for this really kind donation. Now, these adorable rock hopper penguins are found in the Falkland Islands in South America and on many islands in the Atlantic. Beverly is based in Colorado in the USA and visited South Georgia and Antarctica in 2017. In all of her paintings of animals, she wants to celebrate their individual characteristics and spirit and share this with the viewer. And that really comes across in this painting. She found the rock hopper penguins to be adorable and grumpy guys and named this painting, I believe you dropped something, as she felt she could almost hear the penguins inquiring as she looked at them. Next slide, please. And this is our, uh, our, our star lot of the, the auction, and it is lot number one, which is a 10-day Antarctic cruise for two. Sharp intake of breath. <laughs> so the winning bidder of this fantastic um, lot will enjoy a superb once-in-a-lifetime 10-day cruise to the Antarctic Peninsula and South Shetland Islands for two people. The cruise is worth $22,000 or £16,000 and has been generously donated by cruise company Albatross Expeditions. The cruise will take place from the 10th to the 19th of December 2021 on Albatross's new luxury ship Ocean Victory. And those dates are fully transferable if for any reason the cruise is postponed. The lucky bidder will depart from South America in December visiting the South Shetland Islands and going down to the spectacular Antarctic Peninsula. Um, there will also be a pre-departure catch-up, if you like, with UKHT and SGHT teams, where we can offer our top tips on the region. Uh, flights are not included, but we will provide you with some recommendations for a travel provider to book your transfers to and from South America. Right, and next lot, please. We have lot 14, which is a fantastic ski experience for five people at Aspen Snowmass, Colorado, USA. Doesn't it look wonderful? Enjoy a fantastic all day private ski lesson with Denise Landau, president of Friends of South Georgia Island and a trustee of South Georgia Heritage Trust. Denise has more than 40 years of experience in teaching skiing in the beautiful mountains of Colorado. This all day package can be used and enjoyed for up to five people of any age. 
Aspen Snowmass is a world-class skiing and snowboarding destination and has endless opportunities for wintry adventures with 94 trails, plenty of lifts and just one lift ticket. For Apres Ski, there are plenty of great options to play, eat and sleep. You can make your all-day ski lesson just part of a wonderful winter vacation. And the estimated of value of this lot is uh, $950 US. Uh, back over to Camilla for another two lots. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So now for something completely different. Uh, this is the opportunity to realise your dream to be Taylor Swift or Harry Styles. Um, recording artist, record producer, sound engineer and UKHD trustee, Bob Kidby, has very kindly offered a day in the recording studio. Uh, this is your chance to uh, cut, cut your own record in a professional 40-track uh, recording studio in the, in the beautiful Suffolk countryside in the UK. Uh, you'll have access to instruments in the studio if you wish, um, or you can bring your own instruments or backing track, um, whatever you like. Um, but so you can lay down your tracks and have them professionally produced by, say, a, a, a true uh, record producer. At the end of the day, you'll have a CD or a digital copy of your recording to take home and kickstart that overdue career as a rock star. So what are you waiting for? <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. And then this one, it's one, uh, a bit of Antarctic tradition. So I suppose one of the most recognisable features in any picture of Port Lockroy, apart from the penguins, obviously, is the Union flag, which flies throughout the Antarctic season. So every season, the Port Lockroy team raise the flag upon their arrival on Goudier Island. And for the next five months, it flies, as it has done since the base was first established in 1944, whatever the weather. Then the lowering of the flag is one of the very last duties of the team before they leave the island in March mm -hmm. each year. And the flag is often <coughs> after five months of Antarctic weather. This flag um, uh, was the last flag flown at Port Locker, actually, in the last season we were able to operate, which was the 2019-20 season. Um, we also have a second similar lot, which is a flag flown at our, most, our southernmost historic site at Bay Sea on Stonington Island, so right down in Marguerite Bay. And this was flown by the conservation team in 2018 when they spent three months on site uh, doing a conservation survey. This one, the Stonington flag, was also signed by each member of the team. So it's a real one off. So whichever one you go for, you can be sure it's a genuine piece of Antarctic history following a very long tradition of flying flags in Antarctica. Back to you, Alison. Thanks, Camilla. And the final lot we're going to be highlighting this evening is lot number 24 which is a Shackleton cyanotype textile wall hanging. Completely unique, this exquisite wall hanging features images relating to Shackleton's last expedition on the vessel Quest. It has been lovingly handmade and donated by Dr. Catherine Corbishley Michelle, a gifted quilter and member of the Quilters Guild. This cyanotype blueprint technique dates back to the mid 19th century when the scientist and astronomer Sir John Herschel invented a beautiful cyan blue print after exposing a chemistry coated surface to sunlight. Catherine has exhibited her work widely and won many prestigious awards, including at the National Quilt Championships in the UK. Her work relating to Antarctica and South Georgia has been commissioned by several UK museums and displayed in the USA. Thank you so much, Catherine, and I believe you're joining us tonight. So thank you so much for your donation. And indeed, to all of um, the people who have given us uh, these wonderful, wonderful laws, and particularly, of course, to Elaine and Daphila um, for their donations of their amazing art and for speaking this evening. Now, um, we have got an opportunity, if there are any more questions about how to access the auction um, or make a bid before we close, um, if anyone has got any other questions, please pop your hand up and we'll answer those. David. Has David, first. yes. Um, David, would, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, a couple of questions, sorry. Um, the first one is, can I ask to have the auction link emailed to me? Because I'm afraid I can't see it in the chat. Zoom and my screen reader don't really get on. Um, the question I had for um, Dr. Scott was, because I can't see the drawings which you and the artists from South Georgia had shown, can you give me some idea 
if I was standing in the Antarctic, what kind of atmosphere would I experience as I've got no sight, but I can hear, I can smell, I can touch, I can taste? What do you think might stand out for me were I to find myself on the Antarctic Peninsula? I'm really interested. Well, let's go to Daphla first and then to Elaine uh, to see what their thoughts are on that very interesting question. Daphla? Well, it depend. It would depend very much on the weather, mm -hmm. because sometimes if it was really cold, like the day we went to Cape Evans, the wind was whistling through, and it, and any when it was near the building, it was whistling past the building, and and you you would be able to hear that. You would be able to feel the intense cold. So as soon as you took your gloves off, you would you would feel biting, biting cold, and the wind just taking your heat away. And otherwise, uh, as, apart from that, I mean, if the wind was not, would not have been blowing, you would have, I think, have, have felt an immense stillness because it would be very quiet apart from, and, and of course, you know, if you're close to the sea, you would hear the waves lapping on the shore. And in some places, I mean, if you, you know, if you were in, the, in a penguin colony, then you would hear the wonderful noise of all the fantastic interactions between the penguins. And, and it would feel like being in a penguin city, and it's very exciting. It it it's it has so many different feelings to it, Antarctica, and uh, it, you know there, there's a huge variety of feelings that you would you would have if you were there. It's wonderful. Thank you, Daphla and Elaine. Well, um, what I tried to express in my in the in the series of works. Uh, some of the prints are included in this lot, was the a feeling of absence, which is very strange, really, because Daffler's right. Um, particularly in South Georgia, there's so many contrasts. But the, the first impression that I got when I went there and I stood um, on a, a kind of... I stood looking at just... Snow. It's hard to it's hard to describe, but it was. I just felt as if I was alone somewhere, and that there was a possibility that I was standing on a part of the world that nobody else had stood on, and it was the weirdest sensation. It was, and it's it's still with me really. But it's because normally in my artwork, I'm kind of piling information in, and in these. Prince, what I wanted to do was take information out and just leave, leave a sort of feeling of absence. I don't know if that makes sense to you. But that does make sense, yes. Um, I could understand the feeling of solitude, even though I probably have yeah. to be there to really understand exactly what you meant. Yes, exactly. That was it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elaine. And we have a comment, which uh, I would also agree with, which is uh, that, you know, the smell is, is very... <laughs> if you're in a penguin. <laughs> it's fairly unforgettable, too. <laughs> of penguins, krill. If you got close enough to a seal breath, then that would be an interesting smell also. Oh, the nightmare is <laughs> falling into an animal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the feeling of, of the fresh and very crisp air um, that's all around you, and what, which is, makes it actually very inspiring visually, but seems to heighten all of your senses. So, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I would agree with those comments. Thank you for the question. Um, if there, are there any more? I can't see any other questions. So maybe over to... Camilla, for the last word. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I hope, uh, like me, you've enjoyed it. Um, I think, I mean, particular thanks to uh, Daphlo and Elaine for your um, extraordinary contributions tonight. I think, you know, there was real insight into your practice, into your works, into your inspiration and your experiences when you visited South Georgia and, and the Antarctic. And I think for those of us who have visited, I think, you know, what you said really resonates. And I think that's been really wonderful. Um, thank you to, to both of you and others who have donated items and experiences and works for, for the auction. I mean, tremendous to have your support. Um, and I know some of you in the audience um, have done that, which is which is wonderful. Uh, 
thank you to those who organised it. So Camilla and, and Andrew, particularly, thank you for uh, running around and getting all this, getting us to this point. And you know, we're delighted. This is the first time we've done this sort of thing before. So um, you know, it's it, thank you very much for pulling it together. The, the auction is now open. Um, we've posted the, the link in the chat, but also you'll be getting it um, after this um, by email, I believe, as well. So please don't go and explore the lots. There's um, around 30, if not more, um, items in there, uh, something for everybody and uh, all sorts of price points as well. So lots to get you get inspired about and get your teeth into. Um, you can also make a donation on that page as well, because ev every piece of support is vital to us. Um, you know, both, both of our charities are you know, still, still uh, struggling to get through, and you know, our, both of our aims is is are to to get back down south this coming season, um, and that's our aim, and we can only do that with your with your help. So please do um, do that. The auction is open tonight. It closes on the third of September. Um, our next event is going to be on the first of September. So get this in your diary um, with um, Matthew Haley, who's the polar expert at Bonham's Auction House. Okay, so who's supporting the, the auction, um, and that he's going to tell us a little bit about some of the um, polar items that have passed through his hands and through the auction house over the years. So that's going to be a fascinating evening, um, and hopefully, it should um, inspire you all to get bidding over, over the next couple of weeks. But for now, thank you so, so much for your support. Thank you to all our contributors and participants tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, last thing I'd say, happy bidding. <laughs> thank you so, so yes, much. Yes, indeed. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.